we exist, you exist, to bring God glory and make disciples. That's why you're here. Nathan, I thought I existed for my job. Good news, you don't. <laughs> Yay! I thought I existed for retirement. Good news, you don't. I thought I existed for my kids. Good news, you don't. You exist to bring God glory and make disciples. That's why you're here, to bring God praise and credit and then to help other people become like Jesus after he saves them. So that's why we're all here. Read the scriptures, it comes out time and time again. Now he'll do it with farmers and doctors and lawyers and moms and dads and blended family. He does it in all those different kinds of people, but tax collectors, he uses those too. He get all those folks and he uses them for his good glory, but that's why you exist. And certainly, certainly celebrating God well is an important aspect of why we exist. Right? Remember what Jesus said when he was coming in in the great procession before in, in that passion? Man, if you tell these guys to stop praising, what will? Those rocks will. That's how much God deserves praise. That if we would quiet our mouths, the rocks, the Grand Canyon, the mountains themselves would scream out and shout out from their tops. God is so good. Glory, glory, glory. And they don't care who listens. They don't care what the philosophy or the cultural trend is. They shout it out and they proclaim it. So based on this message, what can we do to become more like Jesus? Let's talk about our gospel-centered worship a little bit. So this is you with God in your private time in small ways and extravagant ways point to his magnificence. Small ways and other ways. So they tell me, look how good God is. In your devotions, in your, in your private time when you're reading and studying, Figure out ways to just point to him. You don't, you don't always have to be asking for something. You can just take some time and go, God, you're so good. And if you don't know what that is, you just dartboard one of the Psalms and read that out as your prayer. And you will praise God and point to who he is. And you can do this anywhere. If you're taking a lunch break at work and you got your Bible out, there are small ways and extravagant ways that you can do that, that you can show him that he's true. He's good and that you love him and you're grateful for the goodness that he's done for you and many others. So in your worship, figure out ways and, and really weave that into time, right? That's the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. Before we ask for anything, before we pray anything, it's just what? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? Your name is great among all the halls, all the highways and byways. Your name is great. And we're just praising him in that before we do anything else. So I'd encourage you to find small ways and extravagant ways in your personal worship, which you should be having every single day with the Lord um, to praise him and just point to his magnificence. I mean, it's just, it's unending. It's unending. Plus, you know what? It just gets you ready for heaven because we're going to be doing that a lot. So might as well, let's just start. Let's go ahead and start now. Let's go ahead and start now. Uh, let's talk about community. So this is when you're out with, with other people. This could be where you work, where you worship, where you live, where you recharge. Make a big deal about God and the great things he has, can, and will do. I mean, we could look back on this whole temple story and just tell story after story after story from Scripture about all that God's done. But when you're out in a community, make a big deal about him. The world makes a big deal about all kinds of other things, all kinds of false religions and false gods and philosophies. But you make a big deal. You prioritize him, right? And you just tell him. And it's simple. In a conversation when they're like, man, I'm so glad because this is happening. And then you're just like, well, here's how God is working that. Here's what the Bible says is true. God's made that true. We already talked about John 1, or James 1.17, right? If every good and perfect gift is from above, then any goodness, anything perfect in anybody's life comes from him. It's a natural segue. But you make a big deal about God in community, in your conversations and in your actions. People come over to your house and hang out. Everybody prays for food. Everybody. I mean, I pray with people all the time on the phone, right? Talking to people, asking questions, church, utilities, whatever. I'm like, hey, we're going to pray for this. They're like, well, I don't love God. We're going to pray for this. <laughs> you just do it, right? Because I love God. And get that out there. So I encourage you, make a big deal. Because he's worthy, right? I mean, it, they can keep making telescopes as big as they want. They're never going to find the end of it. Because God's creation is vast. It's huge. They can keep looking at smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller things. And they're just going to find that God keeps making smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller kind of things. So I encourage you, make a big deal about God in word, thought, and deed. For sure, let's talk about service. Here's a great way to serve others when you're there. So God front and center um, with you pointing the way to Jesus Christ. So in the trenches and on the mountaintops, right? So I think of those 
great song, Dre. We're on the mountaintops and we're singing. But you're, you're always putting God front and center and pointing to Jesus Christ through that. And you, and you work that on in conversations. Certainly that's easy. Why you do things and not do things. Where you put your trust in in the midst of the world and the climate. That, that comes out more. Now let me tell you, just like these guys in Ezra. Before God finished his temple and before all that stuff happened, what did he do? He got them right with him first. So it started in their homes as families, as individuals, widowers and widowers, people who lived alone or had roommates. That's how the nation of Israel got where it is now to celebrate, is they started celebrating God where? In their homes with everyone who was there. And they said, this is what God's done for us. You would not believe. And my grandparents were in captivity for the rest of their natural life. And they talked about how one day we'd be set free by God and be in this place. And now we're here and God has done it. So I just encourage you to constantly strive to bring God front and center because he's sovereign over everything. There isn't anything these hands aren't in. There isn't anything in scriptures that he can't lead us through. Whatever you face, whatever they're going through, I would encourage you to, to help people to find that celebration. And then for multiplication, like how do I multiply this truth of celebrating God more. We've got to make a place for others to celebrate God with you, right? Two or more are gathered. Get, bring people in. And when I talk about making a place, maybe it's building a church in the future. Maybe it's having your home and your doors open, your front porches, your back porches, however your house is situated on your property, your cars, the, the lunch table conversations, everything that comes around, you're making a place for other people to celebrate what God has done, to share your grace story, to share your testimony, to share the truth of God at work in your life and just go, here's what he did. Let me give you a place to interact, right? The whole just come and see and invite and be engaged so that you might know how good he is. How else will they know at your work unless you tell them? They're not. How else will your neighbors hear unless you tell them? God didn't put somebody else to live next to them. He put you there. You're the neighbor. You're the boyfriend, you're the girlfriend, you're the engaged, you're the neighbor, you're the husband, you're the wife, you're the boss, you're the employee, you're the one that God's placed there to say, hey, let's celebrate what God's done. And you, you will never run out of things to celebrate God in his infiniteness. You'll never run out. Your biggest problem is going to be which one. And you're going to have to drive to work, you're going to have the prayer time in the morning before the kids get up. You, that's going to be your struggle. God, what, what are we celebrating about you today? He's like, let's do this. This will encourage and, and build them up. So let me share the one thing with you one last time. Man, when God does something great, we should celebrate. And God only does great, so we should celebrate more. It's okay to smile about that. You know, it's okay to be joyful because God does a lot of good things. And it would serve us well to celebrate those. And it's not always going to be roses and, and, and bouncy houses and amazing Sometimes you're going to get beat up at work for loving Jesus. But like the disciples, you're going to walk out those doors and just praise him for the fact that you were counted worthy to suffer for Christ, knowing that the scripture promises you that you will be able to reap the resurrection power of Jesus Christ as well. We do not have to fear man because we serve the Lord. He is our Savior. So we make a commitment to celebrate more. We make a commitment to move and pursue and figure out how to weave that in better into our lives in the way that we think and what we say. So here's what we're going to do.